Today's guest on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie home loans who deal with anyone in Australia, have clients in every state and capital city, and the different areas of expertise include first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans, and personal loans, is one of Australia's most capped men's hockey players. And he certainly was the most capped until Eddie Ockerton took that honour and is still playing today. And who knows with the way Eddie's going, he's going to Paris, he may play forever. But this man went to four Olympic Games for Australia. He won three medals, not a goal, but still a great effort in winning a silver and two bronze medals and also fourth in another Olympic Games as well. He won a champion's trophy. He won a world championship and he played over 300 games for Australia. He's now coaching the under-21 team and, as I say, one of the all-time greats of Australian men's hockey, the Kookaburras. Jay Stacey, Jay, welcome to Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures. Great to have you with us. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the invite. I uh, look forward to having a chat. Long career. Do you look back and think, gee, I achieved a lot? Oh, yeah, now that I'm in coaching and you reflect back on your playing days and I'm also, you know, getting on a little bit and you reflect back um, sometimes with my two sons as well that they're, they're not into hockey, but certainly now that the uh, Paris Games are fast approaching, they're starting to talk a little bit more about the Olympics and share a few little moments with them. Um, some of them are, you know, are real highlights on my career and... Uh, yeah, and there's some disappointments along the way as well. Um, when you're training, you know, sort of four-year cycle and you're preparing and playing tournaments to get to the Olympics and then you don't sort of achieve your ultimate, um, it's a little bit disappointing. But, you know, when I reflect, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the, uh, you know, of what I was able to achieve along the journey. Australian men's hockey team at times have been described as chokers. They would dominate every event, every world event in the lead-up to Olympic Games whether it be in the 80s, I mean, that 85 is probably the best we've ever seen. We didn't get a chance to go to the Games, 84, even 88 into the 90s, but only one Olympic gold medal. Is it unfair to call them chokers? They're pretty hard to win, aren't they, Olympic gold medals? Well, they're very difficult to win. I think, you know, chokers is a is a, is a pretty harsh tag to to live with, but I can kind of understand it when, you only, when we've only won one Olympic gold medal. Um, certainly, we're always around the medals mark. Um, we've got a proud history, uh, the Kookaburras, um, of achieving sort of late in the Olympic tournaments. Um, but, you know, if you were to say last year after, say, Collingwood win a premiership, um, will they win the premiership in four years' time? Uh, you know, your list changes by a minimum of 50%, sometimes up to 70% by once that four-year time cycle has gone uh, gone by, so um, to say you choke us from Olympics to Olympics is a little bit uh, a little bit harsh. I would have thought. Why hockey for you, Jay? Um, at my primary school, a uh, one of the teachers there was um, was heavily involved in a in a local club. Um, probably wouldn't be allowed allowed these days used to bring a big cricket kit full of hockey sticks and just dump them in the yard for everyone to have a bit of a go um, and some balls and things like that. And um, um, yeah, a lot of us, all kids, you know, you want to try different things and different sports. And, and once we sort of had a bit of a, you know, a bit of a bash, bash around and literally sometimes um, uh, in the schoolyard, then, you know, the flyers come out, come down and give it a try and things like that. And I've got an older brother and, he took it up along with a lot of his friends and um, I, uh, mum uh, took me along as well, just, you know, to take him to the, you know, to a training or a trial or whatever. And then I just sort of fell in love with the game. I really, I really enjoyed it. I felt like I was always involved because you've got a stick in your hand and there's a ball and hand eye and all those sort of things. So yeah, I just really fell in love with it from a, um, uh, from an early, very early age. I started when I was five. So yeah, um, yeah, it's a little bit unusual sport. All my mates were playing footy and all those types of things. So they, uh, yeah, there was some good banter around that. When did you know that you were going to be pretty special at it? I don't know if I knew I was going to to be special or or talented at the sport, but I knew that I had a drive and I wanted to be. 
the best that I could be. Um, and uh, my, one of my junior hockey coaches um, reminded me not too long ago, um, at my 50th birthday, actually, um, that he made a little test on a chalkboard in the in the club in the club rooms, um, and he drew a line and asked all the you know all the all the players all the in in his team it was under twelves, or under tens maybe even, um, and he and he asked where would you like to where would you like to be you know playing uh, and it was Reservoir Hockey Club at the time it no longer exists but it was Reservoir Hockey Club, um, and you put a line where you want to be, you know, the club level, senior club, and then all these little marks. And then he, I don't, I remember the situation, but I don't remember where I put my line, on, but I put it right at the very top and said that I wanted to play for Australia. So um, that was um, a nice reflection from him through our junior days. Um, and that was very young, but I knew right from a young age that I wanted to play for Australia. Four time Olympian in men's hockey, Jay Stacey's my guest. On Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, we've got 25 lenders on their panel around Australia. Now, Jay, you were chosen in the 88 team to go to Seoul. You were the youngest member of the team. You weren't yet 20 or almost 20. Was that a surprise or you were pretty confident a long way out that you could get there? And was it a target to get there for Seoul? No, not no, not really. I was I was only very new to international hockey there. Um, I was I wasn't actually selected in the original sixteen. Um, I was in the squad of twenty four. Uh, performed quite well at the national championships um, the previous couple of years, and I was at the AAS and now and now centralised program in Perth, and I was training with the squad and all those types of things, but. Um, I thought it was just a great opportunity to develop and to, you know, to get better in, you know, completing a full sort of Olympic preparation. Um, but along the way, you know, we train pretty close to the edge and, and we still do that. You, the injuries come up from time to time. And um, uh, I was playing in some teams that played against the Olympic team um, uh, in, you know, in the la later stages of their preparation. Um, and there was an injury and I was, uh, I was called in at the last, at the very last minute. I think two weeks before the team departed. So um, I was pretty thrilled. I didn't think I'd be getting much of a much of a game um, over there because that was in the days of substitution rather than interchange. Um, so yeah, I was just going, you know, to be whatever support I could be. And if I got a minute on the pitch, I'd be stoked. And um, uh, but I ended up playing quite a few games. I scored a goal. I, Bits and pieces happened in the tournament, so I was really, really grateful for that uh, for that experience and the trust that uh, our coach at the time, Richard Agus, showed in me. Pretty good team, a lot of experience. Craig Davies, Colin Batch, John Bestel, Warren Birmingham, who you played a lot of uh, hockey with, the great Rick Charlesworth, Dean York, Walk, Hagar, David Wansborough, yourself, Paul Good. Graham Reed, Noel, Roger Smith, Neil Snowden. Lots of experience in that side. Did you have to almost uh, think to yourself, gee, I, I'm uh, in dreamland here playing with some of these wonderful players? Um, well, I'd been playing against them and training with them, so it wasn't really being there amongst those guys, but being at the Olympics and in the Olympic team was a bit of uh, dreamland, as you say. Um, but I had a, a self-confidence that I thought, well, I've been selected now and I've got a role to play here. And as I just said before, if it was for one minute, fantastic. If it was for a game, if it was for however long, um, I was prepared to do whatever was required by the team. Um as it turned out, it was uh, it was Rick's last tournament. Um, I played in the same uh, yeah same team as him for a uh, for a couple of years. His last couple of years and my first couple of years. So that was uh, something always nice to reflect back on. And considering um, sort of uh, if you mention hockey, then everyone mentions uh, Rick Charles Rick Charlesworth or perhaps even Jamie Dwyer now. He's a high achiever, Jay, isn't he? I mean he. Played hockey for a long time. Uh, what was it? It was uh, just trying to think now. 76, uh, 84, 88, three Olympic Games. He's a pretty solid state cricketer. 
He was a doctor. He then became a state politician, uh, sorry, a federal politician, and then he became a very successful coach of both the men's and the women's programs. What made him so good at everything he did, especially hockey? Well, he's got, you know, obviously um, he has attention for detail to be successful in all those sort of various areas. His attention to detail was was enormous. His knowledge and his research on different topics and um, and in, in hockey, he, he researched just like everything else. So, um, yeah, he was a he, he was a very good coach. He has his own way. He's a um, he's a different type of personality to myself. Uh, but um, even today, when I see him around around hockey and things like that, um, we have some we have some good conversations. Um, uh, yeah, about the sport, about sort of different things in in general. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy talking to him. I just, when he's in the West and I'm in Melbourne, um, we just don't get to see enough of each other. But um, yeah, he's got some really interesting ideas. He's an innovator. He challenges people um, in a right way um, to get the best out of them. So yeah, he's. Um, I'm not surprised that he's had so much success as a coach. And now that I'm a coach, there are elements along the way and little lessons you learn either as a player or as a or as a young coach coming through, not only from someone like Rick, but a lot of great coaches that I've had, Jim Irvine in Victoria and Colin Batch, the current national coach, um, was a state coach of mine and teammate as well. So um, there's a lot of experience in that team that you read out um, and knowledge. And, yeah, it was a free education really for me in terms of hockey. He retired uh, after coaching the Australian men's team and he said he wouldn't get back into it. I'm going to have him on the program soon and I've chatted to him about going back to China as a consultant. He just went over for a little bit of a visit uh, with Alison Annan, who coaches the Chinese women's team now, and uh, he said two weeks later, I'm still there. So he just loves it, doesn't he? Can't get enough of it. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he loves a challenge and, you know, he would see that as a challenge. I did see him in uh, in Perth when, with the Chinese uh, the Chinese team where they spend a lot of time there preparing um, in Perth and in Europe. And, you know, Alison lives in Holland and, uh, but they've got a really, a really healthy budget. They've got some really quality people uh, in their support staff and their coaching staff. Um, so I think they're progressing nicely towards Paris. Um, hopefully not too too nicely to um, yeah, to give our girls uh, the hockey roos trouble, but um, certainly they're putting a lot of resources into their women's uh, women's hockey team. So, and Alison's a very se- successful, obviously, player uh, before she became a coach, and um, now she's you know she's been a very successful coach with Holland, and um, now she's with the Chinese team. So. It's no surprise that she probably recruited Rick in to look after a certain area. Now, in that first Olympic Games for you, 1988, uh, you were the reigning world champs and you finished fourth. Obviously, a bit of pill to swallow. Do you look back on that and think of one that got away more than the others? Um, for me, myself, um, um Yes, I know that the the senior guys do who did play in that World Cup team. I think the two injuries cost the team. Although I wouldn't have been there if they didn't get those injuries. So, um, but I think with um, with Peter Hazelhurst uh, being in there um, and Dean Evans, they may have been a different team. It was a little bit like us in Barcelona when right on the Right at the eleventh hour, Mark Hagar, our sort of prolific goal scorer, went down with a uh, with a foot injury, with a stress fracture, um, uh, and had to withdraw from the tournament. Um, that sort of um, uh, took away you know, one sort of lethal goal scoring person. That was his job within the team, and he's very good at it. So you never know what those little changes can do. But certainly, the two changes to the eighty eight team would have had a significant impact on it, bringing in two young guys who probably had half a dozen games under their belt, uh, Michael York and myself. In 92, you'd established yourself in the team. You mentioned Mark Hagar, Warren Birmingham was in that side. Uh, Stephen Davies was establishing himself. And if you mentioned Michael York's name, you always mentioned Ken Walk's name. Obviously, they rhyme, but they were wonderful defenders. 
So it was a team that had established itself and you made the final. Uh, again, was that one that got away or, as you've also quoted, was Germany just a bit too good for you? Yeah, when you re reflect, I mean, you know, we always thought we were a chance and we went there to win a gold medal and we prepared well. We had a good team. Um, um, and we were in pretty good form as well. Um, Germany... Germany had lost the 88 final. They'd lost the 84 final uh, to Pakistan, 88 to GB. Mm. Um, so they were pretty seasoned campaigners in Carsten Fisher and Volker Fried and all of these seasoned campaigners who have been there and done it before. Um, and us, us uh, young guys running around um, doing our best. I've only just recently watched it Um uh, for the first time, actually. Um, and they just looked a little bit more calm and in control and experienced in those type of situations. But we went into the tournament, I think, ranked third in the world. Um, we beat Holland in the semi final, which was a you know, which was a great achievement, um, that far. But certainly, we went into the final with confidence that we, you know, we wanted to take it up to the take it up to the German. And we knew it was going to be an arm wrestle, but um, we really thought we had a had a had a great chance of uh, of winning that, that game. Um, they scored very early, um, uh, and as Germans do, they sort of parked the bus a little um, and controlled the game. Then they scored early again in the in the second half and made it quite difficult. From memory, I think we scored with about Greg Corbett scored on a penalty corner with about nine minutes to go thereabouts. So there was still time if we were good enough. Um, but uh, just on the night, when I reflect now, you know, sort of many, many years on, uh, they were probably a little bit better than us on the night. When a team scores, and we know, as you say, the way the Germans play, I think they've probably changed their style a bit since then, but uh, they did like to park the bus. They were pretty conservative. They scored early. How did that affect the psyche of the team? Knowing, oh, we've got Germany, they'll make it tough for us to score, they'll be defensive. They've scored in the first couple of minutes. Did it affect the psyche at all? Or are you still fairly optimistic you could get back in the game with so much time left? Oh, no, I think we were, you know, that was probably a beauty of the team. We were youthful and young and full of enthusiasm and things like that. It certainly didn't help. We did certainly didn't plan on them scoring so early. We were trying to settle into a game um, and just a, an opportunity, a bit of a fortunate opportunity opened up um, to penetrate our defence. But um, I don't think it really changed the psyche. We're still having a crack and we still were producing some opportunities and some penalty corner chances and things like that. But um, they were a very strong team. They were uh, professional in their their physical sort of play and holding up play and trying to slow it down, knowing full well that Australia's sort of trademark is to play quickly. Um, and we were trying to do that, but they were sort of, you know, getting in your way and knocking the ball away and doing all these little professional things to hold play up or to slow it down, which suited their game style far, far more. So, um, yeah, I, 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 of course it would, you know, it would affect you So when you scored so early, but, we were still having a we we're still having a red hot crack and and we still created some opportunities but um, I think they were probably a bit bit better at handling the situation than we were just through experience. Jay Stacey is my guest on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures four time uh, Kookaburra in men's hockey and he won three medals including a silver and two bronze medals and we're here for Aussie Home Loans. They've got over 25 lenders on their panel around Australia. I just want to go back to 88. The girls probably surprised, didn't they? Uh, the Hockey Roos in winning the gold medal, and they were the ones that started the famous Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. No doubt, even though you would have been disappointed to finish fourth, uh, you would have enjoyed celebrating with them. Were you a little bit envious, though, Jay? Yeah, of course. Um, yes, they... Um... They won a gold medal and very well, and I, I still see a lot of the a lot of the ladies in that team. I still see around uh, around the hockey scene in various states and all of that. And yeah, they've they've done a marvelous job at that tournament. And um, you know, they had a good good coaching staff in Brian Glen Cross, and they've done a they've done a terrific job. 
the the match itself i was there there watching that live i don't i don't really recall that much of it um um whereas you know the games that you play you know i was sort of more there as a watching as a spectator and a bit of cheering them on and hoping they got over the line so but they done a fabulous job um the uh, the hockey roos over a long period of time um you know up until up until sydney really so they've done a great job are they given enough credit? I mean, uh, because, or have we got short memories? Because as you say, it's been a bit tougher in recent times. I mean, they were pretty good, I thought, in Tokyo, and uh, oh, were, we could have nearly won it. Yeah, they were, um, they were outstanding through that period. It's been a bit of a, a, bit of a lean period um, since, uh, since Sydney in 2000. Um, but they've been re- rebuilding and um, and I think they're starting to get, you know, back on track. They had some, you know, some coaches and tried out some people and um, trying to find their best balance you know, through, a, through a long period and even went to Olympics and things. Um, and they started to come back. I, th- I think they only they lost one nil or something to India. Um, uh, come fourth yep. or fifth or something in, in Tokyo. So, um yeah, but I think they're on. You know, they're they're going well now. They're competing with the the top nations, and they've had some really good results of of recent times. Um, they're in Europe at the moment and playing in the pro league, so I'm sure they're going through some. Uh, as as the men are going through some um, some fine tuning of what they want. They've both both the hockey roos and the kookaburras have got 22 players with them, so they have to find their best 16 out of that to go to the Olympic Games. So I think they're going through all those final fine-tuning and team balance type things at the moment. Um, there have been a couple of results which haven't sort of seemed that good, um, but when you are sort of trying things and trying to find your best for the, for the games, then there can be some outlier results there. So um, hopefully they find their best, um, both squads find their best 16 and then we can um, really go deep into the tournament in Paris. We spoke before about Rick Charlesworth being a successful coach, Colin Batch coaching the men's team, Trenny Power coaching the women's team, Adam Commons coached the women's team for a while, Barry Dancer, of course, won the gold medal for Australia coaching in 2004, Terry Walsh has coached in Australia and overseas, uh, Mark Hagar in New Zealand. We've had a lot of very, Alison Anna, we mentioned, we've got a lot of very good players who've gone on to great coaching careers. Why do you think that's been the case, Joe? Oh, I think I think fundamentally it comes down to all of those people you mentioned, and there's many, many more involved in the network and in, in, our, in our coaching system. It's for the love of the game, really, because we all know right from the very beginning that there's no money in the game. Um, so it comes from a deep love of of the actual sport and and wanting to stay in wanting to stay involved in the sport. And once you're playing career, um, there's a lot of time and resources and and money spent on you as an athlete. Um, and of course, that develops a a library of of hockey knowledge and whether you want to use that to go into to coaching or not that's that's entirely up to you but you know players and have gone off into corporate corporate careers and they'd be using some of those skills and experiences through their sport in their corporate world well some other people that you know a list that you've just mentioned have chosen to go down a coaching path and and i'm the you know and i'm the same i, I really love the sport i want i want to remain at the top you know the top three four in the world you know for as long as possible and as the national under 2021 20, coach um, for the last couple of years, not only did we want to be successful in junior tournaments like the Sultan of Johor Cup and the you know the World Cup every two years now and things like that, but we do want to develop these young men um, into kookaburras and we want to sort of you know, provide a conveyor belt for these guys to learn the right way of play, the right skills, the the international standards, the um, world trends that we see. We want to implement all of that so we can, you know, give them a base skill level um, and knowledge and understanding and um, teach them decision-making under pressure and all those types of things because we do, in the end of the day, we do want them to, to all 
to become kookaburras. They're not, that won't happen, um, but we certainly will create some kookaburras along the way. And that's, um, that's going to create a base and a, and a real, um, real depth of talent to, that we can call on in future, future generations and future Olympic cycles. Is the depth still as good as it's been? I mean, the talent pool coming through, I mean, as I said a bit earlier, when Rich Charlesworth and Terry Walsh and Peter Hazelhurst and all those guys were playing in the 70s and 80s and you came through with Mark Hagar and Warren Birmingham and Ken Walk and Michael York and, and Stephen Davies and Jamie DeWire and the list just goes on and on and on, Bev and George, there was always good players to replace those coming out. You're confident with the group of players you've got that uh, they'll come on and replace the current batch playing in the senior team? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's some real, there's some real quality youngsters out there. Um, and a few of those sort of rose to the rose to the top at the junior world cup last year in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and saying that for the Kookaburras, we also identified a few that Germany have, Holland have, France have, Argentina have. So I think the sport of hockey world globally is in, is in a really healthy position. Um, and it's going to be challenging, you know, for the next however many Olympic cycles. So um, we need to keep paced. We need to make sure that we're innovative. We may need to make sure that we're providing enough international competition to these young men as well. Because if you if you can't experience it and you can't play it, then you don't really get the same feeling as if you're playing, you know, at a state level or a a state under twenty one nationals or a, or a um, or a hockey one league and and things like that. Yes, it's very 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 high level competition, but it's another but it's another big level, um, another big jump in levels when you go to play your international. So the more international competition we can get for our youngsters coming through, um, the better it's going to serve them in the long run, um, however far their career takes them. Now, Jay because the hockey tournament always finished at the end and, and started at the start and it lasted the two weeks, you were playing right throughout. But there were so many sports, like the rowing finished after the first week, the swimming finished after the first week. And I had James Tompkins on the other day, part of the awesome foursome, and they had a great time, of course, uh, and they probably led the celebrations for everyone. What was it like having the rest of the Australian team, most of which had finished their events, be there to support you, whether it be a playoff for gold or a playoff for a bronze medal. How much did that help? Oh, it's enormous. There's a in the Olympic team itself, across all disciplines of sport, there's an enormous camaraderie. Um, you're away from home and you've ever, you know, some athletes have been in a training base in Europe, say, even leading into that, so haven't been home for some time. But there's a certain um there's a certain feeling, there's a certain culture within an Australian Olympic team and it's fantastic um, uh, at the end of tournaments when we're playing, yeah, virtually on the second last day. The next day is probably the the closing ceremony or, or at least the one after when they're all there and Barcelona are very special for that with a massive crowd and, you know, there's been some, you know, in Olympia's gone by since then. There's been some reports about people not having tickets and doing certain stuff to their accreditations and things to get in and I'm pretty sure that was rife in Barcelona because there was that many people in there I'm, I'm not sure that the Australian contingent were allocated that many tickets but it was fantastic to have them there um, it was a very um, disappointing sort of somber type finish um, for us and you know having to step up and onto the the number two block and um, listen to the German national anthem and things like that that was was pretty disappointing. But when you go back in the change rooms and you sit around with all the guys you've been slaving away for, you know, four years, sometimes eight years, um, you realise it was a pretty special moment, um, even though you didn't sort of achieve what you set out to do. Uh, But it's a pretty special moment and you have your reflections and things like that. And then when all those people, whether... The Olympian, you know, of course, the awesome force and they won. And then there's other people who weren't as successful or, you know, there's plenty of athletes who don't get a medal, but they certainly, you know, um, record a PB or whatever it might be. So everyone has their own form of success. And um, 
whilst we were going for a gold medal, um, on reflection a few days later, I, I, I think disappointed um, to lose the gold medal, but to take home a silver was uh, was a pretty nice thing. And now, I don't know how many years, is it 30 odd years or whatever, it's nice to um, every now and again uh, show somebody if they're interested or my kids have a look at it or whatever it might be. Um, Wednesday night at local footy, it was um, wear your dad's old jumper night, training night for one of my boys. And wow. he wheeled, he went through my old jerseys and didn't have a footy jumper, but um, he wore my Atlanta uh, playing shirt to footy training just because that's what dad used to do. So that's that kind of makes me proud as well. Would have been a bit cold though, because wasn't it a singlet, Jay? Uh, not not in those days. No, right. not in those days. It was a big, long, baggy shirt, but it was uh, it was a dry fit type uh, fabric. So I don't know if he was putting in a training um, like he should have been. It wouldn't have worried him. So that's fine. No, that's that's fair enough. Did you get to know many of the other athletes? Despite the fact, as I said, you often because you were pretty good. You play till the end of the Olympics. I mean, you did go to four, so I suppose you would have crossed paths with quite a few, and there were quite a few from your home state, Victoria, including, of course, the awesome foursome who starred for a few Olympic Games, as we mentioned earlier. No, exactly right. Yeah, I, I, you know, and obviously my other role, I'm head coach of the men's program at the at the Victorian Institute of Sport um, uh, currently. So from time to time, um, uh, Jimmy Tompkins comes in, he has a bit of a workout in the gym at, at different functions, um, Nick Green, um, as well around the place and of course some of my teammates um, you know I see around the hockey scene and things like that um, also Shane Kelly um, is a cycling coach he was an Olympic teammate and I get on re really well we had a little project in a book together as well so we got to know each other and we still go you know we still head into coaches meetings now um, at different sort of um, seminars and things like that so uh, but Shane Kelly and you know the cyclist uh, a star himself so that's good we often sort of um, have a chat about our sport and our coaching and what do you do with certain athletes in different situations so um, there's a fairly there's a fairly healthy knowledge bank at the VIS and and wherever you go in sport really in Australia everyone's willing to have a chat and help out and most people are only a phone call away. Just on Shane Kelly, I suppose you can relate to him. I mean, he was a red hot favourite, wasn't he, in 1996 and had the sporting tragedy. It's a sporting tragedy of uh, his foot coming out of the pedal. That, that was uh, that was pretty tough, wasn't it? That would go down as, I suppose, one of the more disappointing moments uh, on an Olympic situation, wouldn't it? I mean, when you've spoken to him, Jay, has he spoken a lot about it? Does he feel like... Uh, he's missed out, even though he won a silver, of course, in 1992? Oh, yeah, I, th I think he does feel like he missed out because I think the winning time um, in his event, I think he already beat that in training, yeah. um, that winning time. And he was he was last on the track being the, the current world champion. Um, and he also talks about the percentages of that, of his foot coming out was about like a million to one. Like it's just unheard of. And, and I think from that moment, I think there has been some innovation about, you know, the, the shoes clipping in or the, some mechanical innovation so that that never happens again. But um, it's just an unfortunate moment. He's a ripping guy and a, and a, and a top athlete, um, but he, he couldn't do much about it. It just happened right at that moment. And it's, you know, you just wouldn't dream of it. Um, happening but certainly I'm sure deep down he, he feels like it's a missed opportunity and probably asked himself why me at that time Absolutely, that's sport though isn't it, that's probably why we love it that's why we get frustrated by it Jay Stacey, uh, four time hockey roo, one of the greatest players to play for Australia and uh, for a long time as the holder of the most number of international games for uh, the Kookaburras he has joined me on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans Jade, a 1996 to Atlanta, a bronze medal. Uh, again, you played some great hockey. Again, you just missed out. 
Yeah, for me, that one was probably the one that really got away from us. Um, yeah, we were playing some reasonable hockey, um, absolutely. Um, but I think we just possibly got caught off guard a little bit um, by by meeting Spain in a semi final. Um, they they'd been going okay, and we played them um, in a two twenty five minute um, scratch match before before the tournament started um, because they were in in the other pool. um, And I think we beat them like in 225s, like, you know, 3-1 or 4-1. It was like quite convincing. Um, We played well. We thought we were were going along quite nicely and things like that. Whether that acts... And then as the tournament panned out, Spain were playing some some really good hockey. um, And they ended up... um, yeah, they ended up meeting us in the crossover in the semi-final. Um, and whether that sub subconsciously um, took the edge off us because we'd played them, I'm not sure. I, I often reflect and think about that, um, whether that took the edge off us because we had played them in that practice game and we had been successful, whether we really, um, you know, where we, where, whether we really sort of um, stayed focused and, and played our game and or, or whether we just went out and thought it, it may happen. And it only at that level, it only has to be one or 2%, a fraction off. By no means were we, you know, complacent or anything like that. Um, and we prepared properly and everything was absolutely quite normal. I just, yeah, I have a, that little feeling, maybe just a one or 2% edge was taken off us of, and, and thought it may have going to be happening anyway. So... Um, that's that's one that really it really got got away from us, um, and yeah, we went on to you know to win a bronze medal. We beat Germany for third and fourth, um, which you know which was a nice way to finish. But um, yeah, we really I feel that we really sort of let an opportunity go there. We if we beat Spain, then we you know we get into a get into a final against Holland. So which would have been a great match. They were in our pool, we were even teams. I think they might have beat us 3-2 or something in our round game of very even lists. So it could have gone any way, but going in, we would have been, um, yeah, full of confidence. But you've got to get there, got to be in it to win it. And unfortunately, we didn't get there in those games. So how do you get yourself up when you think that you're good enough to win the semi final? to get into a gold medal playoff and you don't achieve that, but you've still got a game to go to win a bronze medal. Is it hard to get yourself up? Um, it has to happen pretty quick. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you're in a team of 16 plus support staff and coaches and things, every each individual deals with that disappointment in a different way. So you need to give time um, to each individual to absorb that. And I think, I think that I don't know. You don't want to do it too often because you'd be rather playing in the big in in the big dance. But if you have to do it, I think Australians do that that turnaround and that um, that attitude of sort of getting getting on with it. I think we do that probably better than better than some other teams. Um, uh, but yeah, it is a challenge. But we've done it with fairly good success uh, sort of through my period. Um, um, I wish I didn't have to, but but we did do it pretty well. We won a couple of bronze medals. Um, it's always good to finish on a winning note. Um, in some ways, it feels better than the silver medal because, you know, you people say, oh, you won a silver medal. Well, no, we really lost a gold medal. Um, and it's more disappointing when you lose your last match than you win your last match. So. so what's harder to win a semi-final or a gold medal playoff match or a bronze medal playoff match semi-final semi-final well why is that more pressure no not no not more pressure I, I no i don't think it's more pressure i just think it's just it's just an arm wrestle it's just a chess match it's very they're just yeah, they just they're just difficult, more difficult matches. It just feels that way. I can't really put my finger on it of why, but obviously both teams are going flat out and 
want to get to a final, it secures you. If you win, it secures you a medal. So you're going to take something home. If you lose, you've got an opportunity to, like in 88, um, to win or to win or draw all your matches. And then you go out in straight sets and you take nothing home for your four years work. It's, um, that's a disappointing thing. Um, so at least you've got something to show for your efforts. Correct. But I don't know exactly why, but it just feels a lot harder, a lot more physical. They don't give an inch, you know. Sounds a little bit strange, but to qualify for the final, yeah, I, I felt even though the German game was hard, um, the the semi final in Barcelona against Holland was a, and we were on the the winning end of it. Um, it was a very very tough game. Very tough game. And then to Sydney, which was your final Olympic Games. Was that always the plan to finish off in front of the home crowd in Sydney? And again, it was another bronze medal. Uh, did you feel more pressure? Because again, you're obviously going in as one of the favourites and there was probably expectation that you would win. There was certainly expectation that the girls would win after winning in 96. They successfully defended their gold medal, the uh, hockey ruse. And I suppose the pressure was on the kookaburras as well, Jay. Oh, well, certainly, and Home Olympics does uh, does uh, provide some additional pressure. I don't, I don't, I, we weren't travelling that well. We we played in a uh, Champions Trophy, I think it was in in Holland, and we didn't go very well at all. Um, and that was in two thousand itself. So we need to do a little bit of um, soul searching and working out what we were going to do. Um, and we come together. We were trained together the whole time, but we had a break and then come back together. And um, yeah, uh, and we got it to a place where we were playing extremely well um, um, without scoring a lot of goals, but we were sort of controlling games and um, um, and being, you know, assertive and 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 playing reasonably well. So um, Sydney was. Yeah, a, a different experience, um, uh, but the hockey side of it was um, was pretty good. And you know, to get to get through it had its twists and turns, like every Olympics. Um, and it looked like that we were going to be playing uh, Germany in a in a semi final um, because Pakistan had beaten Holland, um, and Holland were going to be out of the tournament. The very last match of the of the uh, uh, round robins or the or the qualification matches, uh, GB beat Germany, which hadn't happened for I don't know how many years, but that allowed that made Germany miss out and Holland come back into the tournament. And we'd seen Holland at the at the food hall after they lost to Pakistan, um, and they were like down and out. They were just completely believed that they were gone until. So they got their second lease on life um, and met uh, met us in a semi final and it was a it was a dour arm wrestle of a game. Um, you know we have some little you know KPIs. We don't want to give too many penalty corners against Holland. That's their main scoring avenue. We didn't give any any penalty corners away the whole semi final. We had one. We weren't successful, but it was just an arm wrestle the whole night. Um, both teams weren't taking that many risks. Um, um, but it was a real arm wrestle, and of course, um, history shows it went down to a, a penalty penalty shootout. Um, yeah, they scored five, and we scored four. Unfortunately, the, their save hit the keeper on the helmet and went wide. Our goalkeeper, he he got a good piece of one, hit his shoulder, and dropped behind him and went over the line, and that was a, that's enough for uh, enough to qualify. And Holland weren't playing particularly particularly well that tournament they were um they were three zero down in the final against korea um south korea who we we'd beaten in the round games um two or three one um then they come back to three all then they won the final in a penalty shootout as well so kudos to them from coming sort of back from the brink um yeah to uh to clinch their back-to-back -back gold medal as well because they won in 96 as well and all you guys used up your luck in other lives, Jay. I mean, you're so unlucky. I mean, it's not just um, 
it's not poor performance. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a lack of luck, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, I'm well, not real. I mean, you make your own luck. We had a penalty corner, and yeah. you know, um, we called a penalty corner. We we think we're going to be successful with. We scout the opposition. We do all our our research and our game plan and things like that. And and sometimes, yeah, it doesn't come off and it didn't come off then, but we only had the one opportunity. Normally we would, you know, probably get, you know, four or five corners and per match and Holland do the same and they score a few, but we were, you know, very good defensively and didn't give them any opportunities. So, you know, that's a, a tick to us. And then, yeah, we weren't as, penetrating as we once could have been. I think we probably could have taken a bit more risk. And I remember playing on, you know, Turn de Noya, who's a wonderful, probably the best opponent I've ever played on, a, maybe apart from Shabazz Ahmed from Pakistan. But, you know, um, you know, my attention was trying to sort of nullify him a little bit more and probably not be as, uh, you know, trying to have as much, as much impact as I probably needed to have or, should have had or could have had or whatever, but you know, at that time, you're nullifying one of the best players in the world, so you think you're doing a good job. But you know, in hindsight, you can probably take a few more risks. But there's a lot riding on it. So the the ability to be able to take risks when that um, when the important moments are there is um, um, is a, sometimes a difficult thing to do. And um, and I coach now, and that's you know. Um, I'm trying to emphasise on, yes, you need to take risks. There's, you don't win anything playing safe and things like that to the young bloke, the, the young men that I coach at the moment. Um, so it's difficult to take risk and, and take calculated risk and play um, assertively when there's a lot riding on things. And that's, um, yeah, that's a critical factor in being successful in those big matches. So you think in that semi-final... Uh maybe slightly tense because of the occasion. It was a home Olympic Games, big chance to play in the gold medal. You felt your chance of winning the gold medal if you got through. Netherlands not in great form, that you were trying not to lose instead of maybe trying to win. You are a bit cautious. Um, not not as, um, as black and white as that, but I just think we probably could have been a little bit more assertive and... You know, we weren't, we were certainly wanted to, you know, keep our defence tight, but that was with every game that we played. Um, that wasn't, that wasn't something new, but I just think we probably could have been with the ball. We could have probably could have been a little bit more assertive in what we did and a little bit more, more testing. And Holland were the same. They were trying to slow the game down a bit that, you know, we wanted to play fast, but they were the same. They were tentative as well because they weren't in good form. So they, it was a real arm wrestle. That's another game that I, I haven't, um, I haven't rewatched, so maybe I should do that one day. You got nightmares, Jay. I suppose you do when you you lose a game that you think you probably should win. Oh no, not not no, nah, not not nightmares. Certainly, certainly not. And you know, it's um, I wouldn't say we should win, um, but we definitely created some some opportunities to win and but I think we could have taken the game on a bit more to create more opportunities to win um yeah not not nightmares did I want to win absolutely and bitterly disappointed but um yeah as you said before that is sport and every you know if the Olympic Games were easy then you know everyone would be playing them so um, it's a tough uh, it's a tough gig and we know what it's about um, we're experienced in that area. Um, but we just uh, we couldn't make it happen on the night. We're getting a great insight into Australian men's hockey from one of their all-time greats in Jay Stacey, four-time Olympian, 88, 92, 96, 2000. He won a silver medal and two bronze and fourth in 1988 as well as a teenager. And uh, this is Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, where their areas of expertise include purchasing a property, owner-occupied or investment. You can build a property portfolio. You can refinance with them, debt consolidation, cash out, construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, and all sorts of loans, such as equipment, car, and personal loans. So playing for the bronze medal there, uh, were you flat or were you so determined you had to win a medal in front of the home crowd? No, no, we were, we were, um, 
yeah. So once again, we went through that phase of disappointment and we missed our opportunity and everyone deals with it. But um, we re we regrouped. We were at home. Um, everyone's obviously more family and friends than normal um, were around and um, everyone wanted to play well. Um, you know, penalty shootout can go either way. It wasn't as if we played bad or anything like that. It can go either way. It just didn't go our way. Um, so we were, we were very keen to put a, a, a very good performance. Some guys had already announced their retirements, um, Stephen Davies, Michael York, a few others. Um, so we we wanted to, you know, at the end of, once again, at the end of a campaign, of a, a four-year campaign, we wanted to put together another good performance and have pride in our performance. And and we did that. We really, we really took uh, Pakistan apart in that game. Uh, I think it was 6-2 in the end. And, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we were able to, you know, win a bronze medal, but certainly not the one that we were going there for. So were you thinking with the way you played in that match, which was almost the perfect game, when you win 6-2, it just about is the perfect game. Did you think what might have been if we had to play like yeah, that well, in the semi? We, we get up and win? Yeah, well, you, you were often... Yeah, you often think like that, but Pakistan play a, a, a more open sort of style. It's a different type of game. Um, but I think Pakistan, I'm, from memory, I think Pakistan might have even scored first. So um, maybe we didn't get off to the best start that we that we got. From memory, um, I, I could be wrong, but from memory they scored first. But um, no, the game really opened up, which it can do against sort of an Asian sort of style of play and it opened up and... Once we sort of got a goal or two and, um, yeah, we just sort of went on with it and, um, yeah, we really dominated the match and, you know, the, the crowd were on their feet and, you know, it was it was great reward for our for our efforts, not only through that tournament but for everyone's effort right through that campaign. Um, yeah. Did you, just on that, I mean, a few players had retired, Stephen Davies being one, Michael York another. Did you know it would be your last Olympics or you were keen to go? And have another crack at it in two thousand and four. No, no, I um, I well, I knew it wasn't. Well, I didn't want it to be my last game, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to get to two thousand and four. Um, my in my head, I thought I would like to continue on. I wasn't going to rush into any any decisions before that. I would, you know, let the, let the dust settle after a, after the Olympics in Sydney, and then just see. You know, see how I felt and what I what I wanted and things like that. But um, um, yeah, I had a plan on after that sort of period. I had a plan that I would like to go to the next World Cup. Was it which was in the beginning of two thousand and two? So basically, you have a rest period um, after the games. The games finished in October, so you have a rest period, and then it's really one year preparation for another World Cup. That's what I had planned in my mind, but. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out, and you know, and and high performance sport. Um, Terry Walsh uh, wasn't uh, reappointed after that, and Barry Dancer, who was the great uh, Great Britain coach um, at the Sydney Games, um, he was appointed national coach, and he had uh, he had other ideas of what he what he wanted um, from his squad moving forward. Um, and things like that. And I sort of expressed that, you know, I, I was very keen to hang around to the World Cup, um, not not necessarily, a, you know, uh, uh, another Olympic campaign, but to the next World Cup and sort of help with a little bit of transition um, with some older guys going out and some new ones coming in and things like that. So, but he had other ideas and said that I wouldn't be required. So um, that was the end of that. How did you feel about that, Jay? I was pretty disappointed because I, I, you know, um, uh, I suggested a few things or what, you know, and he said, no, you wouldn't be, you know, required and things like that. Okay. Yeah. But what if I perform well at the national championships, which I'd done, you know, many years before and, you know, and, you know, if I'm a, the best player there or whatever, would I be considered for selection and things like that? And he said, no, you wouldn't be considered. Um, so he had a, a total, um, difference. He just wanted a new squad, and they wanted to, um, yeah, wanted to head in that direction. Which um, at the time I didn't really, um, 
I didn't really understand or I didn't really like that. But being, you know, being a coach for, for a few years now, I, I do understand where he was going. Um, I probably uh, have learned a little bit in the coaching too because um, Barry, he rang me, rang me from overseas and I've been in the national team for 15 years and I, I, I would have preferred it happened a little bit different rather than a phone call. I would have preferred maybe, you know, sit down and have a cold beer or a coffee or whatever it might be. And, and then, you know, and say, this is my plan. Da, 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 and you had a great career and all of that. I just, I thought after 15 years of, you know, slaving away for the, for the kookaburras that it might've happened in a, in a different manner. Um, but the actual decision itself, I can understand. So I, I would have appreciated it a little bit different way. He was a bit different, Barry, wasn't he? Look, at the end of the day, he got the result. The only one who's won a gold medal for Australia. But um, yeah, he probably wasn't as open with his players, reading about him and learning about him and doing interviews with him, unlike others. But it, it seemed to work because he got the best out of the team and they won that elusive gold medal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's done a, he's, you know, very successful coach, and and obviously won the our only Olympic gold medal. So yeah, fan, a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic effort. Um, about the coaching, I've never, I've never really been coached by him, so I don't know the sort of uh, the ins and outs of how he deals with players and things like that. Um, but he's been very successful. Um, you know, good on them. They have a reunion every year and celebrate their gold medal win and. He's produced um, some good coaches from that cohort of athletes as well. So um, he's doing a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot right. So um, yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. Now you talked about Pakistan a bit. India were a strong hockey nation. Cricket's taken over as, a, as their number one sport and probably almost the number one religion. Do you ever see those two nations becoming as strong again as Australia, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany are? And part two to that question, why are Netherlands so strong? Why have Germany always been strong? And why are Belgium now one of the strongest nations? Uh, the first part, um, well, India, they made it to the podium in Tokyo for the first time for a long time. Mm. Um, uh, I think they're the introduction of the hockey India league where it's a bit like the IPL in cricket. They yes. have an auction systems, but they have some criteria in place. So on a, um, on a playing roster of 20 athletes, 12, 12 have to be um, locals, Indians, and you can have eight, eight imports. Um, so you get six franchises. So you've got um, 70, 72 athletes, whatever it is. Um, um, uh, playing with the best players in the world and foreign coaches and things like that. And I really believe that accelerated. I was fortunate enough. I coached um, Debang Mumbai in 2016 and 17 um, uh, in the league. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. And it's no surprise that there was a real upward trajectory of Indian hockey with all of those athletes playing over a sort of six to eight week period um, against against the best and with the best local players, there was a, a dramatic, well, an acceleration in their development for sure. Um, so they're back and they're competing. Um, Hockey India League stopped um, in, I think, in 2018 uh, because the FIH introduced... Um, the pro pro league, which started yeah, right. um, in January, and it's a world you know worldwide competition. Um, so that's when the hockey India league was on. So it stopped then, and I think there's been a little bit of a de decline back in the Indian in the Indian system or the in Indian athletes, um, although they're far more competitive than they were. Um, uh, and Pakistan, yeah. There's no competition, no hockey competition. They used to host the Champions Trophy. They, you know, they founded the Champions Trophy, but there's no Champions Trophy anymore. No one's been there for, you know, whatever, 20, 30 years or whatever it is for a tournament. So, um, yeah, you can't be what you can't see. So the youngsters, the amounts of money in cricket, they all want to play. They're already, a, you know, if you say, oh, what's your, what's your 
national sport. They all say um, hockey is the national sport, but the most popular is cricket. So, right. um, so all the youngsters are playing cricket, and uh, both in India and Pakistan. And I think that's just led to a lot of talent going to cricket rather than to hockey. Um, they're just starting to come back. Roland Altman's the ex the old Dutch coach. Um, he was coaching the. Pakistan team at the Junior World Cup and he's now coaching the Pakistan team at the Nations Cup which is on soon I think in Poland so um, and maybe there's seen a little bit of improvement in them but until they're until they sort of sort out some in, internal struggles with their associations and things like that and um, regularly competing at tournaments um, and you know one day you know if they can safely have you know, host tournaments or host teams and things like that. I think you'll probably see a resurgence uh, in that way. Hopefully, and of course, um, yeah. The other one was about the leagues, yeah, because it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful place to play in Pakistan and India, and the crowds and they're just awesome, awesome places to play. And there's some of my best memories playing in a packed stadium in the 1990 World Cup. Um, had a semi-final against Pakistan. There must have been seventy thousand people around a around a hockey pitch. It's an unbelievable experience and great memories. Belgium, uh, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. Um, they have some of the best domestic competitions in the world, if not the best. Holland has had that for for many many years. Um, I played there myself for about after I finished with the national team. I played there for about seven years. Um, uh, with a club in Eindhoven in the south of Holland. Um, but it's very professional. It's, you know, it's, you know, it, it, while it is professional, I get foreigners in, they, you know, they train professionally and they're probably similar. Well, the big soccer club out of Eindhoven is PSV Eindhoven and they sort of run similarly and manage similarly to that just on a, on a smaller budget. Um, and you play every week and you and the games are there's always something riding on it and you're representing your your village or your your or your small town and um I just think that playing at that level more regularly you play twenty two games in a season they've also got a European hockey league where the top three teams from Holland qualify and the top three teams from Germany qualify so there's there's more high performing performance games that they're able to play in so they're just gaining experience all the time and um, and I think yeah, that's why they're able to maintain their standards so high all the, all the time because of there's such their strong domestic domestic leagues. Are they the main rivals for both the hockey roos and also the kookaburras in Paris, Germany, Holland, Belgium, maybe to a lesser extent Argentina? Although they're probably not as good as they were, are they? Yep. Um. Well. Yeah, they are. They we just had some trouble with them the other day, and that'll be they'll be interesting. Great Britain have been playing some really good hockey of late as well. Um, Spain are coming good. They've got uh, Max Caldos, the uh, ex Argentinian player, but he coached the Dutch women as well. He coaches Spain, so they've got a really young squad, but they're coming through again, which will um, which will provide some you know some difficult times for oppositions. Um, but in the in the women's side of things, the Dutch are sort of that's a Dutch by the length of the Flemington Strait, and then it's the rest uh, the rest of the world. So if you can get them on a if you can get them on a poor day and you have your very best day, then I think um, you know the hockey roos would be in with a chance. But um, China are coming, um, you know Germany, Belgium are coming in the women as well now. Um, so. They're doing some, you know, great things. Adam Commons is the high performance director of Belgium Hockey, and he's done an outstanding job both in the men's and the women's, um, in maintaining the men at the highest level, but also developing the women to being a real, a realistic sort of medal chance in in Paris. Um, and they spend a lot of time and energy, and you know, they're well resourced uh, because they are, you know, producing medals and they produce the uh, the first world i think it's the first world championship gold medal for any team sport in belgium um when they when they first won it and then they went on to win the olympic gold medal as well so um yeah they're um they're way up there belgium um 
in the men's, in the women, they're definitely coming with a rush. So it's going to be exciting, exciting times and exciting competition. Um, in the Olympic format now, there's a quarterfinal. Um, previously, it had been two, two pools of six. Um, it was a straight crossover, first in pool A, play second in pool B in the semifinals. Now it's the, the top four um, crossover, so one will play four. Um, so that's, uh, you know, when we are talking before about the semifinal being the toughest match, I think the quarterfinal is very, very difficult. It may seem easy if one plays four, but it certainly doesn't reflect the game that, you know, a team finishes at one when the, when the world competition is so close, apart from sort of the Dutch and the women, but certainly in the men's, it's, um, it's very close. Uh, between all de- teams, and you need to be on your on your best game uh, as often as possible. You like the introduction of the quarterfinal, Jay? Um, well, I, my experience in the last World Cup, we were uh, junior World Cup. That is, we played, we met France in the in a quarterfinal, um, and we lost three two. So that's the end end of your tournament. Yeah, um, based on that. Uh, no, uh, if we had a one, I would have been in big favour of it. But um, yeah, it was three two. It's a, it's a tough game. It's an early end to your tournament, uh, but it certainly keeps the tournament alive um, um, for a little bit longer. But it's certainly a, a cruel way to to go out because you could you could win all your games, finish on top of your pool, and you play the fourth team who has a day out, and you have an off day, and it's and you're out of the tournament, I, there's no sort of second chance. Now, just before I let you go, you mentioned before Toon De Noya of Netherlands or Shaz Ahmed of Pakistan, the hardest players that you played against or best players you played against. Who's the best player you played with? And as we, I've mentioned a few times, there have been some absolute superstars in the Australian hockey team, including the great Jay Stacey that played during your time, Jay. Oh yeah. Now that's probably the most difficult question um, you could ask. Um, there were some great, yeah, great players in all different, and everyone had different, different skill sets, you know. And you mentioned some of the great defenders. Um, you know, my teammate uh, Dave Wansbro was, you know, quite exciting and um, skillful and creative. Um, uh, yeah, fullback York and Walk combination. Um, Stephen Davies was the, you know, they dubbed him the Maradona of hockey and when he had his long hair and all that type of stuff and he was a, a goal-scoring machine. Um, he was, yeah, he was one of the best players. He was one of the best players I played with. Um, in the earlier days, of course, I was the youngster and always looked up to Colin Batch being a Victorian and, and things like that. He was, you know, the quiet achiever, but, you know, he always got the best out of himself and had a lot of impact in games in being creative in setting up play. Um, goalkeepers as well. We've had some cracker goalkeepers, um, which is, you know, vital when you're going into big tournaments to, to save the savables, of course, opposition is going to score goals from time to time, but um, yeah, keeping most of them out um, um, stands you in good stead. Um, yeah, Dean Evans was probably um, one that we didn't see the best of um, with some injury and things like that, but he was a very classy player. Um, he come from WA. Um, his nickname was Jack Evans. Um, but he was a classy player, player as well. And then you, then you had your sort of, you know, your tradesmen, your your workhorses and stuff like that. And you know, one of my best mates uh, even today, um, Ash Carey, just locked down left half and you know done his job. And you know, we can't all be playmakers. We can't all be tradesmen. We can't all be creative players. But we need all of them in our in our team to make sure that you know the team operates and rows in the same direction and, you know, and can be as a unit, be as defensively sound and, and creative going forward the other way. So, um, yeah, some tremendous players and, you know, it, it's hard to sort of pick any, any one out of them, but they all had their own strengths and their own, um, um, their own importance to each team that I played in. 
And before I let you go, Jonah, really appreciate your time being part of the program for Aussie Home Loans. Aspirations, considering you're the under-21 coach at the moment, aspirations to coach the senior team or if not the Australian senior team or the Australian senior women's team, maybe a team overseas? No, I'd like to, you know, I've, I've been in the Institute of Sport. I really love the development side of things. Um, I do... I do miss the the competitiveness and the um, and the competition of coaching in tournaments and 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 working with a with a group of athletes, you know, to provide an environment where they can be their best and the team can perform at its best, and that's what I do with the with the under twenty ones um, national team. As far as aspirations, yes, I want to continue on with my coaching. I want to continue to learn, continue to develop. Um, I don't always get it right, um, uh, but I've really enjoyed the journey so far, and I still think I've got a bit to offer in the in the coaching ranks. Um, so we'll just see what opportunities, you know, present themselves in the future. And you know, but I'd love to, um, of course, you know, as I dreamt as a young kid playing for the Kookaburras as a as a mature age man now, I'd I'd really I'd really dearly love to coach the Kookaburras one day when that opportunity presents itself I don't know but um, deep down I'd like to coach them one day um, well I hope you get forward. that chance it'll be fantastic and I really appreciate you joining us today it's been a hell of a career over 300 games I don't think anyone uh, thought that record would be broken but not only has Eddie Ockenden Jay broken that record it's a quick one here he's 100 plus past it when do you think he'll retire he just keeps on keeping on doesn't he the great man yeah, he, he does. He's um he's amazing. Um, Ed, he's um, still moving as good as ever. He's yep. his hand eye skill. He, he's very important to the Kookaburras moving forward. He's changed positions that many times. He's been adaptable and and flexible to, you know, to serve the team. Um, he's a great ambassador for for hockey and for sport in general, really. So, um, he can play. He can keep on playing. Um, he's got a young family and all that. I'm sure that comes into the equation. Uh, now, but um, yeah, uh, I'm sure he'll make the best decision for himself. But um, moving forward, but yeah, the, the amount of games he's playing is incredible. I mean, that happens in all the areas because you know I think Rick, you know, when he first started playing, they only they only played New Zealand six times in a year, and then by the time I was sort of playing, we were playing twenty to twenty five. Yes. internationals in a year and then now they sort of play you know sort of 40 to 45 so if you're um if you're like eddie and you you know you're robust and your body stands up and things like that then you know he's one of the first picks so he can rack up plenty of games and he's played a in all of those games he's i haven't seen too many bad ones so he's um he's tracking along nicely so yeah good luck to him i'm not sure how many he's on he's on he's going to I think it's 427. Or something like that. Something oh, yeah. ridiculous like that. Yeah, or is it? Okay. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were, so you were be robust. Up to him. He's a, yeah, he's a great investor. Sorry, you were, you were robust Sorry. too, though, Jay. I mean, what do you put that down to? I mean, you talked about Mark Hagar getting injured in 1992 and you talked about uh, Evans getting injured and having an injury play career, but you didn't get injured too often, did you? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that, no, I didn't really. I mean, it's you need to be just as professional in your recovery and what you do and in the gym. And um, I, I guess I was naturally born with a, you know, with a robust body as well. Um, those two guys you mentioned, you know, it was a Mark went out with, he had a bit of a hot spot in his foot um, and they didn't know sort of how bad it was going to be. So he just kept on, they had a contingency plan. They just kept playing because I didn't know if it was going to break. Um Fortunately for us, you can't replace them once the tournament starts back then, but now you can. But um, So unfortunate for him, but fortunate for us that something went amiss prior to the tournament. Otherwise, we would have had to play one short right through the tournament. And for Dean, it was it was an ACL, a twisting type, you know, um, type injury. So it was an ACL injury for him. So disappointing for them. Um but I think it's down to recovery, what you do off the field, how you treat your body, whether you get your sleep, whether you're doing all the right things. Um, don't get me wrong, I had a good time along the way, but I think you have to be, um, um, you have to have good decision making and good timing to make sure that you're you're living a 
you're living a normal lifestyle with your mates and your friends and being, you know, developing normal. Um, but you have to always make good choices and and remember that you're a high perform high performance athlete and make decisions based on that. Jay, appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, who uh, have got numerous areas of expertise. You can purchase a property, owner-occupied or investment, building a property portfolio, refinancing, debt consolidation, cash out construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans and personal loans. They deal with anyone in Australia. They've got clients in every state and capital city, and they do Zoom as well. Enjoy the Olympic Games. We hope Australia can win gold, certainly in the men, and uh, push the Netherlands all the way in the women and keep enjoying your coaching. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Dan. I really enjoyed the chat.